Well, gentlemen, I'm drunk. And I feel this is about the only time I can really tell this story. So here it goes. In Afghanistan, the Marine squad leader. On an extended patrol, basically sit out there and watch the surrounding desert, occasionally catch a few guys in placing IEDs. About 0130, checking up on my guys to make sure they aren't falling asleep or need anything. Get to my last Vic. The guy in the turret says he is watching a group of about five guys walk to a compound in the distance on thermals. Grab thermals, get talked on to them, and that's when it gets weird. Technically, they were colder than the surrounding environment. Weird. Keep eyes on since nothing else to do. The entire time, they are still heading to this compound in the distance. Get there, they spend about 5 minutes milling around outside, it looks like they go to the front gate a few times, but it is hard to see. I don't know how, but they got the gate open and then sprinted right inside. Hear distant gunshots, call it in. The COC says to check it out, it could be the Taliban ducking up the locals, get everyone up and ready for the blackout conditions and move to the compound, rolling up on the compound, about 500 meters away. See a kid book it out of the compound, run straight out, and happen to be toward us. I say, duck it, flip on the lights. He sees our lights and heads right for us even faster than he did before. Gets to us, starts screaming at us, and our turp is flipping sheet. Just as he got to us, eight dudes came out of the compound and started sprinting towards us as well. They are still 300 meters away, so we pop a star cluster at them to get them to halt. Still running. 200 meters away, pop another. Kid is still babbling, and Terp is screaming to shoot. Get on the radio, keep COC updated, they hit 100 meters, and the pen flare goes off. 50 meters, COC says it's my call. They are now within range of our headlights, all of them are covered in blood. I give it the go ahead, too close to effectively use our .50s and marks, so thank duck my turret gunners grab their saws instead. The whole squad had dismounted by then, and Doc was checking on the kid. Eight dudes getting lit up by three saws and the rest of the squad mag dumping with their rifles. Needless to say, it didn't take long since we were marines, and we generally don't miss. Check the bodies, all unarmed but drenched in blood, more than could be accounted for with our five-second one-sided firefight. Call it in to check out the compound. Set up a cordon. I take the Zan Terp up to compound. Terp is screaming to just level the place with an airstrike. Fucking Terps, always saying we should use way more than we should. Sometimes they're right. At the gate, it was not forced open, but there were body parts right on the inside that looked like one person had been ripped apart. Real nasty, worse than when I saw a chick ripped in half from a mortar. Guns up, clearing the rest of the compound. Everyone inside either has their guts ripped out, arms ripped off, necks torn out, or is otherwise dismembered and dead. Call in what we found, and COC tells me to stand by, smoke a couple of cigarettes. Terp is asking when the airstrike is coming in. COC finally gets back and tells me that a special human exploitation team is coming out to assist. What? We've got a kid who is basically in shock and a whole bunch of dead bodies. Whatever they want us to wait for, we'll wait. COC also says not to go into the compound, it could be rigged with IEDs, thanks for the timely intel guys. We wait for about 45 minutes when I get a call from a hello asking us to mark an LZ for them. Alright, I don't know why they couldn't just drive out here, I hope we don't have to drive them back to whatever FOB they came from after they're done. Hello shows up, lands, drops off three dudes, then takes off. Hello, Corporal Anon, I'm Major So and So, heard you had something interesting for my team, give him a rundown of events leading up to the shoot order. Did you go inside? Yes, sir, we did. We conducted a full search of the compound and found nothing. He gets quiet, goes over to the bodies, and uses the blue light on his flashlight to check out the bodies. 
Blue light makes it easier to see fluids like blood and oil at night. Hmm. He calls his two guys over, says a few words, and they drop their packs and start changing into MOPP gear. Think rubber suits, rubber boots, rubber gloves, and gas masks, if you don't know. She tells me to just wait. More waiting. They go inside, spend five minutes, and then, about five to eight gunshots, real quick, probably different people shooting simultaneously. Oh shit. Without thinking, I grab a couple of my guys and book it to the compound again, calling out for the major. Oh duck, if we missed a spider hole or something and got them killed, we are ducked. I'm the first one in through the gate, and just as I got through it, one of the guys stepped right in front of me and said everything was fine, they just had a negligent discharge. He also says they found an IED manufacturing room and that we should leave since it isn't safe and they are doing the same. What? Who the duck just accidentally shoots off eight rounds? And we sure as she didn't miss something as big or important as IED components. They finish up, and Hello comes back and picks them up. We head back to base and get redirected to a larger FOB halfway there. No explanation, I was just told to go and link up with a captain. Already exhausted, we get there at like 8 o'clock. As soon as we called in for permission to enter friendly lines, we were told to wait. Again. 30 minutes of sitting in front of this gate, waiting. Finally, we get waved through, and we are immediately directed to a staging area right on the inside of the wire. Guys are standing in MOPP suits, get told to dismount and shed all our gear. Apparently, the Major found evidence of possible chemical weapons in the IED factory, so we need to be scrubbed for exposure. We get shuffled off to some makeshift showers where we strip down and hand off all our gear to dudes in MOPP suits that clean it while we get ourselves a nice freezing cold bleach shower in what amounts to basically a few tarps hung up for a semblance of privacy from the rest of the FOB. After it's all said and done, they give every last bit of our gear and ourselves a full scrub. We got different vehicles since it would take them longer to do those. Plus replacing the crew systems and other electronics in them. A few weeks later, we got sent on some convoy ops to a major FOB. Get told the whole squad has to go to the doctor to check for any adverse reactions to the exposure from that night. Get our blood drawn, then nothing. I went on a patrol near where that compound was later, there was nothing left but a crater. All the locals stayed away from it too. And that, my friends, is my story. I can elaborate on why I think Sheet was not on the level due to minor details, you don't use bleach to clean up chemical weapons, that's for biological stuff only, etc., but there it is. Mostly uncut and from my perspective at the time. Background info. Be me. Single mom. Five years old son. My husband died three years ago. Crushed to death in a machine at work. Settlement money. I bought a Victorian house that was modified into a fourplex. Front of the house is our apartment, with a sunroom up front. The first tenant has to walk past our apartment to get to there. Apartment on the first floor. Walk past the first tenant's door to the back door. The back door of the house leads to a stairwell. The door has been modified and needs to be buzzed in and out of stairwell or have a key to prevent package theft. Those stairs give access to all apartments, but they are also the only way to the top two apartments. I rent to these people so I can work part-time at home and be there for my son. I have a great son. Smart, talkative, gentle, funny boy. Friends with everyone. Sometimes too friendly, even. I spoil him at Christmas and birthdays. His grandpa on his dad's side comes disguised as Santa to visit every Christmas. Son loves the visits from Santa. Around December, talks about Santa all the time. This year, he started to talk about Mrs. Claus. Weird, and I also hoped he would drop it so I didn't have to try to. Get a Mrs. Claus to come visit this year, too. 
son and I have a usual morning routine. Breakfast, bath, then I get him set up in the sunroom to play for an hour or two while I work in the living room adjacent. This day, I can hear him talking a lot. It sounds like he's having a conversation. I go to check on him. Our goofy dog follows me into the sunroom. Goes apes heat, runs to the window, barking and losing it like he just saw the devil. Not like dogs, maybe a rabbit or something. Son says it was Mrs. Claus coming to visit. Okay, weirdo, and I go back to work. The dog won't come with me, though. Dog won't leave his son's side. Two more times. I hear dogs bark and go ballistic at the window. People walk by our sunroom all the time to get to the back, he's used to it. I'm not sure why he's so upset. Then I hear a loud crash. Son starts crying. Dog losing his sh asterisk t. I rush in, nobody is around the sunroom. Dog freaking at the window. Son freaking too, saying, Mrs. Claus, throw a rock at the dog. Mrs. Claus, mean, etc. I take my son to another room and try to figure out what, if anything, he saw. He said he couldn't tell me about Mrs. Claus, because... Then the Christmas magic wouldn't work, and Santa... Wouldn't come. He said some other things about her magic, talking to him, offering him snacks, and doing magic. Sounded like make pretend to me. Still call grandpa over to hang out with us for the rest of the day, he leaves that night. The dog wouldn't stop pacing around the house that night. Next morning, usual routine, but ask son to stay in living. Room with me. Dog in the backyard playing. About 30 minutes later, go to get the dog. The dog is dead. Phone coming out of mouth. Nothing is wrong with him externally. Son is not okay. Dad said it would cost serious money to do labs and an autopsy to figure out why he died. He was seven years old and a large breed, that said probs natural. Still tragic. Son and I go home heartbroken. Later that evening, my son is hanging out and playing while I make dinner. Hear him giggle a little for the first time all day. Then he goes silent. I run to go check on him, and he's lying flat on the floor. Lips turning blue. Call 911, go to the hospital. It turns out his son somehow got a huge dose of Benadryl and overdosed. CPS is called. Now CPS is coming around as if things weren't bad already. Childproof our house even more than it already is. Locks on the tops of doors, medicine in the safe, etc., hardcore childproofing. I also won't leave my son alone at all now, start sleeping on the floor in his room. Hear his little voice talking late at night. It sounds like he's having an argument. I shoot up fast and hear some banging noises. See nobody. Again, he says he was talking to Mrs. Claus. Starting to think it's a ghost? Go back to sleep. Next morning, I get a call from the tenant. Squirrel trapped in the back staircase. Someone propped the door open, and the animal got in. I chase it out, close the door, and hang a sign reminding everyone not to prop open doors. Whole time I felt watched. Starting to think the house is really haunted. Go inside and do our morning routine. While drinking my coffee, I started to feel weird. Blurred vision, extreme fatigue, unsteadiness. I knock the coffee mug over in my stupor. Spills, I notice some white powder at the bottom of the cup. I try to call grandpa. Drop phone. The back doorknob starts to turn. The door was unlocked. The only thing holding the door shut was the child safety lock at the top of the door. Son starts screaming and crying to let Mrs. Claus in. Grandpa shows up, and then the police show up shortly after. Locked in the back staircase, clawing at my back door, like a rabid animal. She was a white-haired, toothless old woman. She was skinny and emaciated and smelled like shit, clearly homeless. But with white, curly hair and wire-rimmed round glasses. In the bushes surrounding the outside of the house, police found empty bottles of Benadryl, a step stool, some blankets, cans of food, and tons of trash. This woman had been sleeping outside of my house, talking to my child. 
convincing him to do things. Even throwing stuff over the fence for him or through open windows. She had convinced my son to dump a powder into my coffee that morning. And convinced him to unlock the back door. She had been buzzed and mistakenly by a tenant, and she propped the door open for herself to come back later. She came back and hid. She probably watched me chase the squirrel around and hang the signs up. She had been tapping on windows, trying to get my son's attention. When I tried to call grandpa, the call went through before I dropped my phone. He heard the woman screaming. I don't even remember her yelling. He heard my son screaming too and rushed over, calling 911. I had to explain to my son that she was pretending to be Mrs. Claus. Which made him realize Santa, as a whole, is people pretending. This is the second worst Christmas we've ever had. I used to work in the gas industry as a geologist from 2007 to 2009. I was in contrast with a Russian company called Northgas. Back when industrial relations with the UK were still fairly cordial, there were lots of potential gas sites in the Siberian region far up north, and I used to go around potential sites with company borehole engineers, usually in groups of two to three. Anyway, I was at one site in northern Siberia with a German engineer in late October of 2008. It took ages to get to and was completely devoid of human habitation. But it was really beautiful, endless forests are on the drive up there. Anyway, the site we went to survey was fairly typical of what you expect in the industry at these sorts of locations thin topsoil giving way to permeable siltstone which are excellent locations for surveying. Now to the story. We came to a location where satellite imagery was suggesting that permafrost was retreating. It's still ducking snows and ice is over. Of course, but the key point is that it's not entirely frozen over. You can install stuff during the summer months and get gas production up. It was a pretty boring landscape though, with very thin topsoil giving way rapidly to permeable silt stone. There were lots of these natural holes all over the place too. Permafrost plugs that had melted and left 20 to 30 meters deep holes dotted all over the place. We decided to stay a few weeks and do some test surveys. The first week was completely fine. We got some good locations and things were progressing smoothly. By the end of that week, though, things were getting a little weird. Every time I would go out with the spectrometer after that first week, I'd occasionally hear some noises from the holes. I was never near them, because while you get a lot of gas coming off these things, they're not really good for industrial drilling. It was faint. Just on the border of hearing, I never knew how to describe those noises until a few years later, when someone took me out to a jazz bar and some guy was playing a violin-like instrument that made this drone noise like a fum disconcertingly. It makes your hair stand up. My colleague would notice this too. It's disconcerting, as in this job. You're not really working together but apart, so two of us were hearing stuff out there. We were both rational people, at least for me at the time. So we put it down to cave noises. Laugh, forget it. About 10 days into this survey, it started happening at night. Again, faint but really ominous, that drone noise. We used to sleep in the back of the van we had brought, but even through those doors. We heard it. Again, stop being stupid, it's cave noises, laugh, have a few beers, go to sleep. It got worse from there. The day after, I found some slime around one of the permafrost boreholes, yeah. You get lichens and mosses around these things, not an issue, but this was like petroleum jelly. That really viscous stuff, I touched it and immediately regretted it. It felt a lot like pork belly fat, it was warm too, which was really disturbing considering it was minus 5 Celsius for you Amerifags. During the day out there, Ring around the German engineer to take a look, he looks troubled. For the rest of the day, I was definitely on edge too. I kept looking back at the borehole too, just to check. I kept saying to myself, things got worse at night, that drone noise got a lot worse. But it felt and I know that's a sheet way of putting it like it wasn't from below but above. On the surface, my German engineer tried to laugh it off, but I could tell he was seriously disturbed by it, just that low, foom, eventually. 
We get to sleep. God knows how many hours later, though. We wake up together because there is definitely something attempting to open the door handle to the passenger seat of the van. Click, click, click. And now that drone is right ducking outside. And it sounds a lot like gurgling. At this point, we both freak the duck out and scream like a pair of little girls. It stops. We don't sleep for the rest of the night, and it doesn't come back. The next day, as soon as we make it to 9 a.m., we cautiously open the doors. The entire back door is covered in this pork fat sheet. The place reeks of something rotten, too. The passenger door just smeared in that stuff, but the thing that made us immediately go duck it. We're leaving, was the passenger window, which was also smeared in this gunk and had an outline on it. Like something had pressed its skull into the fat stuff and left an outline. It was unmistakable some elongated human skull with no eye orbitals. Jelly stuff was all over the area around us too, and of course, it led all the way to that borehole. We got out of there very fast after that, but as we were packing, that drone sheet started again from that hole, and it was loud. It was guttural by this point. Whatever the sheet was making, it was down there and close too. A German guy went pretty nuts after that. I just hopped in and immediately started going. Equipment that was still out for methane measurements just left. I didn't stop driving for the next 14 hours. I pretty much ditched my job soon after. I had no desire to be left like that again in the middle of places like that. German guy. Never heard from again. He never talked about it to me anyway. Nice story. Thanks for posting. Thanks, I suppose. I guess the distance from that event makes it sound pretty prosaic. Spooky noises. A woo. Slime. A woo. During that night, though, I was convinced I was going to die. You know how you can just tell when someone or something like an animal is nice, curious, or just out to duck you up. I knew instinctively that whatever wanted in didn't want to crack open a beer and ask us about geology, if you get my drift. Anyway, I spent a long time after I had calmed down about it, which took a few months. In fact, to think of a rational reason for this, every time, though, I kept butting up against the inexplainable. Sure, drones could be cave noises, but the warm slime stuff, the guttural noise, around 2012. I got a lot into reading about frozen mammoths and the worry about viruses from the taiga that they were expecting because of climate change, and at that point, I went full X and said, duck it, frozen monster.